Hey fellow babies, welcome back to this week's Pactor Factor on sifted.net. Uh, we're hopeful you are Patreon patrons at two bucks a month. Obviously, if you value any of the content on Sifted, you can contribute whatever you wish. You can even contribute a dollar once. Um, but you know, if you check the Sifted offerings on Patreon and see what level makes sense, if you can afford it, two bucks for Pactor Factor and you get one of these a week, so it's actually a pretty good deal. If not, and you're watching on YouTube, that is cool. We have it on YouTube because I am not gonna require anybody to, to pay to hear my pearls of wisdom. Our first question from the Sifted site from Sean Finn. Do you think cell phone manufacturers will create docking stations similar to the Switch? If so, do you think it could lead to cell phones becoming the primary hardware for TV-based gaming and or perhaps desktop computing? Well, dude, here you go. If I have enough cord, there's a docking station for an iPhone. So this already exists. And for Apple to turn that into something where it actually does more and plugs directly into the TV is pretty easy. So the answer is yes. I mean, I think that's super easy. I don't think you need the docking station to hardwire to the TV. Um, Amazon has a television uh, called the Element. It's manufactured in South Carolina because Jeff Bezos is interested in currying Donald Trump's favor. So jobs created in North America, um, in the US. But it has Fire TV built in. So if it has Fire TV built in, the Amazon Alexa device, whatever that is, the Echo, the docking station for your phone will talk to it eventually. So yes. Um, I do think you're going to get cell phones being, you know, the, the device that you could play games on your television pretty easily. Um, and ultimately, yes, I think you could do desktop computing. I think you do lots of stuff on your phone. Um, it's funny, I go into meetings now and tons of guys have iPads with a keyboard and they take all their notes on the iPad. I see guys with the same keyboard and they'll put their phone on it, you know, same thing. So they're taking notes in meetings with me and putting them on their phone. It's just a matter of time before you have Excel, you know, working on there and Word working on there. Um, I would give it maybe two more generations of cell phones. And I think that becomes standard. So pretty easy to get gaming to work on a phone and work on your TV. And once these things have CPUs and GPUs fast enough, why not console games coming? So I've been talking about this for years, but I, I, I am absolutely convinced that's going to happen. Okay, our next question from Sifted from Ash. What is your take on the new Atari Micro Console project? You know, Atari's got a ton of software. You know, from the rumors I'm hearing, the price point is a problem because it's expensive. So it's, I've heard as high as $299. Um, it really depends on how much software you give me. But, you know, considering that you're looking at an NES Classic and a Super NES Classic at 80 bucks, it seems like a lot to be spending $299 to kind of have the same experience. Now, if Atari gives me 500 games, you know, everything that ever showed up on the Atari 2600, maybe, but I think that's a stretch. I mean, we're really gonna have to see how much they give you. Um, I think it's a fun, nostalgic, cool thing to buy for guys who have too much money and, and don't care but I think it's really gonna have trouble becoming a mass market product at $299. I'd rather have a Switch and play Zelda than have an Atari 2600 box and play you know, Centipede. So we'll see, I mean, I don't know, because I am one of the few people you will ever encounter who actually bought an Atari 2600 with his own money from his first job. So I had one and I remember buying it um, I've actually bought every console that ever existed until they started giving them to me for free. Um, but yeah, I, I had one and I loved it. I thought it was so cool. Uh, Missile Command, remember that? God, I played all those games. Um, I was a big fan of Centipede. Anyway, I don't think it's gonna be successful if the price point's too high. How's that? Same, same as I feel about the Xbox One X. Okay, um, we're gonna run out of out of storage on this media card before I finish reading this question. because, And for those of you who celebrate birthdays while I'm reading this question, let me know on Twitter and I'll wish you happy birthday at Michael Pactor. All right, let's go with this question. It is the longest question I've ever seen. It, it rolls three pages. 
Okay, why do season passes rarely go on sale, even if a complete edition of the game is available? Street Fighter V recently announced an arcade edition for 40 bucks, and the season two pass is currently 30. It's cheaper for me to buy Shadow of Mordor's Game of the Year edition as opposed to the season pass. I also bought Dragon Age's Game of the Year edition for about 20 bucks because all the DLC would have come to 25. Wouldn't publishers generate even more revenue if the season passes get a price cut once the new editions go on sale? Okay. I mean, the answer is that for guys who bought the game, they aren't going to sell you the Game of the Year edition. I agree with you that if you can buy the Game of the Year edition for 20 bucks, you won't buy the season pass for 25. Um, this is kind of what we saw with Destiny. Like every time Destiny did a DLC, the game got repackaged as Destiny, including the DLC. But they were smart. Like Destiny was 60 bucks when it first came out. The first DLC, I think, was 20 bucks. And they said, ooh, reissue the game for 60 with the DLC included. Then the next DLC was like 20 bucks. They did it again. Then the next DLC was free. Then the next DLC was 40 bucks. So they said all three downloads, you know, 80 bucks worth of download plus the game for 60. So where Activision was super smart was they kept the price of the game constant at 60 and they just kept reissuing it with all the, the accumul cumulative DLC. That's what I think publishers should do. But you mentioned Street Fighter V, which is Capcom. I can't remember now. Street Fighter Cap yeah, Capcom. They probably weren't even sure what the game was going for, you know, in uh, in the U.S. Um, Shadow of Mordor. I mean, you know, Warner Brothers is pretty good and pretty smart, and they probably figured most people wouldn't buy a new game; they'd just buy the DLC. But but I agree with you. They should price it so that you don't have you're not encouraged to go buy another copy of the game because theoretically you could trade in your old game, and then you get ten or fifteen bucks back on that toward the purchase. So they'd rather you not trade your game and you need your game and play the season pass. So the easy answer is, if the publisher is smart about how they price it, what you're, the, the scam you're playing won't work. Activision has been very smart about it um, because the full game with all the DLC still costs more than just the most recent DLC. But you're right. If you already own Destiny and you could get two DLC, three DLCs for 80 bucks, and it'd, it'd be cheaper for you as well to buy the, the cumulative um, DLC for a total of 60. That's re Activision is, tr is pretty smart. They're trying to do it right. I mean, I get your question, but I don't think it's a huge problem that keeps the publishers up at night. Our last question from Patreon from Mark Spellman. Hey, Pack. ATVI was the first stock I ever bought back in the 20s. I hope you don't mean 1920s. I hope you mean $20. Um, since then, and a lot of credit to you, I built an overweight gamer portfolio with EA and Take-Two as well. What do you think has driven the returns and what's going to keep the rally going? All right, that's a good question. Um, these stocks have gone up because in... For between 2007 and 2010, they all did okay. They all went up. From 2010 to 2013, they didn't do well. They all kind of languished. And the reason was that most investors who have never played a video game in their lives thought that mobile was going to put the publishers out of business. No one would ever buy a console game again because they were playing Candy Crush. And the publishers weren't really good at mobile. You know, EA did it, but they sucked. And Activision wasn't in it. And Take-Two wasn't in it. And so their stock's all kind of based around, it for Activision, the teens. Actually, all three of them. All three were in the teens. And then the next-gen consoles came in. The publishers got a lot smarter about microtransactions and ongoing monetization. You started seeing them making a higher percentage profit, so that they call that operating margin. Their operating margins went from 20% for Activision to 35, from 10% for EA to 30, you know, from 5% for Take Two to 20. So, you, so what investors saw was incremental revenue, and extra every hundred dollars of revenue growth, these guys are making 50 and 60 percent. 
So a little bit of revenue growth gave you a lot of profit. And so suddenly the publishers were in favor and the stock started going up. At the same time, the publishers got smarter about monetizing DLC and microtransactions and mobile. And so they all have, you know, what they call recurring revenue streams from digital. So each of them went from not very much revenue from all those things to lots and lots of revenue and the stocks kept working. What will keep them working from here? If the addressable market for their products grows. And that's going to happen either because consoles get so cheap that everybody has one or because games move off the console and you don't need a console to play the game. So that could be a streaming solution, which is possible, it's technologically possible, or it could be that you play the game on any device that has a CPU and a GPU. That's coming. Uh, we're probably five years away from re a, a really easy solution, but I think you're going to get companies like Amazon, Google, and Apple to sneak that into your home. So this docking station my phone is sitting in could end up having a CPU and a GPU in it. You might have to make it thicker and have a fan, but why not? And then maybe maybe my phone's the CPU and there's a graphics card in there and it's, and it's plugged in so it's not running that hot. You know, it, stick, it sticks up off the ground and a Bluetooth connection to my TV and what do you know, I've got a game console. My Amazon Echo, you know, which is a tower, could have that built in. My Echo Show could absolutely have that built in. This is coming and as that comes, then if the addressable market for games is instead of 250 million consoles out there, it's 2 billion households with some device, a phone, a tablet, a PC that can get can play games, you're looking at huge revenue growth and profit growth at the publishers. So that'll keep it going. Uh, you're going to probably have you know, ebbs and flows, the stocks are probably going to go down and then up and then down and then up. But over the long run, I think you make a lot of money. So I think it's actually a good, a good industry to invest in. We appreciate it if you are a patron. We will appreciate it if you become a patron. If you can't afford it and you don't want to spend the money, that's cool. We'll still offer these on YouTube. I just can't guarantee that we're going to keep making them. So um, Shane is close. Please consider it. If you're watching on YouTube, Please follow me on Twitter so I can hound you into joining as a patron uh, at Michael Pactor. And I really appreciate any comments, any retweets, any consternation about something I might have said, about something you care about. But thanks for joining us and we will see you in a different outfit and different, different hair length next time. Thanks again. Bye-bye.